Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this avenue of prayer, which was given to us when Jesus spoke the words from the cross, it is finished. And the veil was rent, the curtain that separated us from the holiest of holies was torn in half, granting us entrance into the very throne room of God. And Father, we don't take that lightly, but we are told to come with our praises, our thanksgivings, our petitions, but come boldly. Lord, we know that you are the ruler of all things, the creator and sustainer of all things. And Lord, it is to you that we sing our praises. It is to you that we give our thanks for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you will continue to do. Your promises are sure. The word tells us you cannot lie. You make a promise, you will uphold that. And we are thankful for that, Lord. We're told that you do hear our prayers. And if we repent of our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us those sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to put us back on the path that you have prepared for each of us, Lord. We're on a journey. Salvation is in an instant, but sanctification takes a lifetime. And so, Lord, as we walk this path that you have prepared for each of us, we thank you for the guiding light of the Holy Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give us each and every day. We thank you for the inspiration and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who is with us wherever we go. And Lord, forgive us when we fall. Forgive us when we take those detours which are so pleasing to the eye, but are just waiting, just traps waiting to take us off of our intended course. Lord, help us to be strong. You've given us the strength of Christ, Lord. You've given us his righteousness. Help us, Lord, to use these gifts as we move forward each and every day that we have yet on this earth. Lord, as our brother Jack mentioned earlier, this is the Memorial Day weekend that our nation sets aside for our war dead. It is not to be confused with Armed Forces Day or Veterans Day when we acknowledge the living. This is a day we remember those who died, either in helping to attain or to maintain the freedoms that come from you, Lord. All that we have comes from above. And we're thankful for those who put their lives on the line and lost them. Lord, I pray for their families. Their families, in some cases, many generations later, as our war dead have paid the ultimate price since the Revolutionary War. And Father, we are just grateful that they were willing to do so. Lord, I think of others who are willing to pay the price, the missionaries who are on the battlefield, the spiritual battlefields around the world. I pray for them, those who have lost their lives serving their Lord. Thank you for their sacrifice. Bless their families as they go on without them. Of course, the ultimate sacrifice is the one who was without sin, came to this earth for no other reason than he loved us, loved us so much, he wanted to save us from the fires of hell. And so we thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross, dear Lord, freeing us from the final enemy, death. Freeing us, dear Lord, from the, from the bondage of sin. Setting us free. We are grateful and thankful 
for that and will be so eternally in heaven above. Just as we are thankful for what we have here in this earth, Lord, it is our prayer that we might only keep it. Things have changed a lot just in recent years. And so, Lord, I don't know where we are in your timeline. This may be the beginning or even the middle of the end of America. I don't know. It may just be a downtime when we get a bit of a rest before our engines are recharged and you take us to greater heights. Lord, we don't know any of that. We put our faith and trust in you in this life as well as in the next. So bless all who are here today, Lord. Several in our fellowship are traveling. We pray that you would give them journeys, mercies, keep them safe and bring them back home. Lord, we thank you again for all that you have done and continue to do for us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, welcome to all of you who are here. Again, I know there are several out of town, but it's good to see everyone here. Uh, Lord's blessing us with another nice day, it looks like, and so we are always grateful for that. Pastor Ron is away visiting family in New Jersey. He will return uh, later tonight. He wanted to pass his thoughts on to all of you. And yes, I as well, and thank you, Jack, for always remembering those who are watching online. Uh, I don't forget about you, but I sometimes forget to mention you all. And so we are always grateful that you are able to join us uh, at a distance in our fellowship. We do have a missions meeting, a brief one after church today. Uh, we seem to be a congregation that meets and eats. Uh, beyond that, we, uh, we do those two fairly well. But uh, again, you all are invited always to join our missions meetings, our um, solid ground ministry meetings. That's open to everybody. Ladies' Bible study is this Thursday as we open another month, the month of June, 7.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Those of you who are able to be here at 7 and pray with the ladies, you are certainly invited to do that. Men's Prayer Breakfast this coming Saturday, June 3rd. Bob Evans on Bel Air Road, 7.30 a.m. And the previously mentioned Solid Ground Ministry meeting next Sunday after our worship service. See the note, uh, especially on the shoe boxes. Um, our donations have been met. Thank you. We appreciate uh, those who have taken care of that for the uh, month of June. And uh, in July, we'll be collecting paper pads and notebooks. And uh, we still have May today and a few days this week if you have any uh, children's socks that you can bring in. We would appreciate that. One thing I didn't list on here, uh, because I hadn't done it yet until late yesterday afternoon, Gail and I stopped at Hereford High School, where there is a uh, mobile or traveling, if you will, uh, memorial to the war dead. And it is uh, extremely well done. If you get a chance, uh, it's still going on this afternoon up at Hereford High School, uh, just off of Mount Carmel Road uh, on York Road. And uh, you, you won't be sorry. It's um, very enlightening, but uh, you'll shed a few tears. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to our next item of business, which is the scripture reading. Please stand as we welcome Brother Joe for our scriptural reading. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49, as well as Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Luke chapter, 40, chapter 24, beginning with verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the songs concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, that tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. And then Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up unto heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now we will be blessed by Pastor Dave's message while we wait. Please be seated. Thank you, Joe, for the reading of the word and the blessings that we receive when we open the word. I don't want to overlook the importance of Memorial Day in our nation, remembering that it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and tradition. Many of our founders carried one of these with them everywhere they went. We've been given our freedoms from God, and they recognized that. And so that's first and foremost, to always remember from where our freedoms come. Many Americans also, down through the centuries now, just about 250 years worth, have gone to war to maintain those freedoms, paying the ultimate price by shedding their blood and dying on the battlefields. I can remember, as, as I'm sure probably every one of you in here today, when I was a child going to the cemeteries of my war-dead relatives, where they were buried. Both sides of my family come from up in the coal mine region of northeast Pennsylvania. So we would traipse through the cemeteries up there looking at gravestones, people born in the 1800s, people I was related to but had never met. And again, we all are in that same boat, aren't we? So many of our relatives that went on before us. We decorated their graves with flowers and wreaths. That's why we came to call the 30th of May, which is the actual Memorial Day, we call it Decoration Day because we decorated the graves. At the end of our service today, I want you to pay attention to the words of the song that we'll sing. It's one of Captain Paul Hallowell's favorite songs. I miss Paul and Elma. They moved down to Florida a few years ago, and I know they uh, continue to uh, watch us and or listen to us, and uh, we're grateful for them. But the song we're going to sing is popularly known as the Navy Hymn, but in its stanzas, it really honors all branches of the service. So you'll, you'll see that. And of course, the one we hold in greatest remembrance is our Savior, the one who died to free us from sin. He also freed us from death. We're no longer to fear death. He freed us from that so that we will not have to eternally lie in our graves. He resurrected. He ascended. 
which we who are trusting in him will also do. So I'd like to look at that a bit today. As we have passed, for any of you who count, we've passed the 40-day mark. Jesus walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection and prior to his ascension, seen by many, many people. And on that 40th day, he went back to glory, went back to heaven. So we try to get as close to that 40-day period. We're always off by a couple of days because we only do this weekly. Uh, but we are not too far beyond that. Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago as the Lamb of God. And at his second coming, he will return as the Lion of Judah. But what about in the meantime? What's going on between those two advents? What is he doing now? Again, the 40-day mark is past. Easter this year fell on April 9th. The 40 days beyond that was May 19th. So last Sunday would have been a good Sunday to have this message. Obviously, we had our missionary from Chile, Paul Duran, speak, and we're blessed by that. So I thought I, I better get it done today. We can tie it in, obviously, with Memorial Day as well, some of the music, and um, remembering that Jesus also paid that ultimate price, didn't he? Jesus went back home to heaven. Now, why did he go back? His disciples certainly wanted him to stay. Well, he went back because the work which he had come to do was done. It is finished, he said from the cross. In John 17, verses 4 and 5, when Jesus was praying in the garden prior to the crucifixion, he said to his father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me. In other words, return me to heaven. When we arrive in heaven, we will be glorified. We will have our glorified bodies. He said, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus left heaven to come here. We will much more fully appreciate what that means when we get there and see what it is that he left behind to come here to this once pristine world, beautiful creation that God put into place that mankind then quickly, I might add, ruined. In John 19, verse 30, as he died on the cross, he said, as I've said a few times already, it's finished. And then he gave up the ghost. In the text that Joe read for us, we see that Jesus was taken up bodily into the clouds while his disciples watched. There was no mistake in where he was going, what was going on. Bodily, he was lifted up into the clouds and into heaven while his disciples watched. We read in our responsive reading today in the 110th Psalm that God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The redemption of mankind has been purchased by Jesus on the cross. So that part of God's plan which the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, was charged with, is now complete. The job was done. What do you do at the end of your workday? It's time to go home. It was time for Jesus to go home. But even at that point in God's grand plan of redemption, the disciples did not clearly understand what was happening. They lived with Jesus for three years, and still so much of what he said, kind of like it does with me a lot, and maybe some of you, just goes right over the top. You have to hear it over and over again. 
And then you have to be told after the fact. Now do you see what happened? So they weren't ready for this. They didn't understand a lot of it. They asked Jesus in verse 6 of our text, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Are you now going to rule from the throne of David? Okay, you've done all this. You've resurrected from the dead. Now take your rightful place. Well, I can't imagine the emotions that must have been running through his closest friends during this time. Again, it was only 40 days prior that they thought they had lost him permanently at Calvary. And now he was telling them he's going to be leaving again? Why couldn't he stay? Why could he not stay and rule on earth? The reason is simple. It wasn't time yet. We are learning as we go through our sanctificational, is that a word? Our, our walk of sanctification, let me say it that way. That God does things in his time. How many prayers that you have to have answered right now don't get answered right now? Maybe not tomorrow or next week or next year. He hears them. You'll get an answer. Wait is an answer, by the way. But it wasn't time for Jesus to stay and rule from earth. But we are an impatient lot, aren't we? We always think we know what's best. Well, the Bible has a few things to say about that, too. We learned a verse in our evangelism training years ago from Proverbs 14, 12. It says, There's a way which seems right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Anybody else go down dead-end streets? I can tell you where most of them are. <laughs> They're out there, yeah. They don't end well, even though we think we've got to figure it out. I'm so glad God is in charge. He is our sovereign creator and our Lord, and he providentially rules his universe. It's not ours. It's his universe. And he rules everything that's in it, from the largest planets to the smallest creatures. You ever see how fast a hummingbird flies? I almost got clipped by one the other day going to my car. I don't know where he came from. But he, they are quick. They're so small. God sees it all. He knows where they're going. He knows from where they've come. And his timing is perfect. His plan's impeccable. And he's not yet ready to have Jesus return to earth. And the reason for that is us. Look in the mirror and you'll see one of the reasons he's not back here yet. The church isn't complete. We were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the creation of the world. So how could he complete his job 2,000 years ago and rule from the throne of David for the next thousand years, which would have been the millennium, which would have ended a thousand years ago, and then off to heaven, everybody would have gone. What about us? We weren't even born yet. That had to happen. And what has to happen is all the others whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who are not yet born, have to arrive so that the church can, at some point in time, become complete. And then when the church is complete, God still has some unfinished business with his chosen people, Israel. So can we just let God be in charge of the clock? And in the meantime, we can take a look at a few things that Jesus has done and is doing right now for us as we live out our remaining days here on this earth, doing what we've been called to do, which of course is witnessing our faith in Christ to 
to an unbelieving world. I'm glad someone witnessed it to me before I became a believer. There are at least three things which were accomplished by Jesus' ascension back into heaven. One is that he is our advocate, and as such, he intercedes on our behalf. A second reason is that he has gone ahead to prepare a place for you and me. And the third one that we want to take a look at is that he has sent us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Regarding Jesus' advocacy for us, Romans 8.34 asks, Who is he that condemns us? Who is it that condemns us? Christ died and is risen again. He's at the right hand of God. He makes intercession for us. And it's because God the Father has declared us righteous in Christ, he is not going to condemn us. Jesus died, he rose, and he lives for us. So he's not going to condemn us either. And so because of this, what shall we fear? What shall we fear? What can we fear? We have all the security we'll ever need, the ultimate security in Jesus. No matter the circumstances, no matter who would come against us, no matter how powerful the forces, nothing can damage our relationship with our Lord. Nothing. You want to turn to Romans briefly in Romans chapter 8, verses 35, and then 37, 38, and 39. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And then verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in the universe is outside of God's control. Again, therefore nothing can separate us from his eternal love. In Revelation 12.10, we read where one of Satan's activities is to accuse the brethren, you and me. And of course, our defense against that is to bank on the merits of the death of Christ. Remember, he is our intercessor. He is in heaven in bodily form. There's another reason for that. He just needs to show God the Father the nail prints in his hand, the hole in his side from the spear to declare our imputed righteousness. Now you'll notice I skipped verse 36 in Romans 8. Let me read that to you. Verse 36 says, As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We might get killed. Not just the missionaries that get killed. Christians are being persecuted around the world. Again, not to that degree yet here. My guess is it's coming, just don't know when. But be prepared. But understand, short of the rapture, we still need to get to heaven. So in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter how? Does it really matter? Once you're there, does it really matter how you died to get there? Difficulties 
in this life are not necessarily obstacles for us. It's just God's appointed way. It's his plan. And let me remind you, he gives grace sufficient for whatever you must go through. I'm always reminded of the martyrs of the faith, in particular the reformers back in the 1500s who were burned at the stake, singing hymns while the flames were, were eating them up. They didn't feel the heat. They were singing glory to God. God will give you grace to get through what you need to get through. It's part of his plan. Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called, according to his purpose. Again, his purpose, it's about him. God put us here in this time and, this, and in this place as part of his plan. We've gone over this many times. None of us decided when, where, and to whom we would be born. And we didn't have a say in the matter because it was the Lord who needed us when, where, and to whom we were born. He needed all that to accomplish his will, to fulfill his purpose in our lives. He knows what he's doing with us. Remember, as Christians, we are in a battle for men's souls. And it may cost some of us our lives along the way. Again, missionaries are fully aware of that. When they sign on the dotted line and head to places that are very dangerous. There are some countries in Africa right now where sharpened machetes are waiting for you if you're a Christian. North Korea is no playground for Christians. Neither are many of the Muslim countries in the Middle East. The true church in China meets underground, behind closed doors. It's difficult. But again, it's part of fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. We don't know what exactly lies ahead of us, especially now in this woke world. Did you ever think you'd be saying the word woke as much as we are? I woke up this morning. Uh, they've changed so many meaning, meanings. I'm doing an article for the June Defender where I'm going to talk about some words whose meanings have been changed. But we don't know what lies ahead of us in this crazy world. One thing we know for sure, though, is that the, another term, cultural Marxist, but you can plug in other titles for that. They want Christians out of the way, and they would prefer that we were dead but just be rid of us. But even if it means death, remember what we just read in Romans 8. We're not separated from Christ. In fact, it's through physical death that we receive eternal life. It's been granted to us now, spiritually, but you don't get there physically until you die. Christ's bodily death on the cross saved us spiritually, and our bodily death on earth ushers us into heaven above. So again, let's not get so hung up on how we're going to leave this earth. Instead, let's rejoice about where we're going. We're going to heaven. When I was little... The long ride to the beach didn't seem so long and hot. And Well, I don't get hot, but you, you understand. It didn't seem that bad once we got to the beach. You forget about the ride. Once you get to heaven, you'll forget about what you went through to get there. And when we get there, 
we're told Jesus has a place prepared for us. Turn to John 14, although you know these verses. Mr. Hannity quotes the first one all the time. I wish he would quote the other two. But John 14, 1, 2, and 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a comfort that is. What a comfort to know that those who have gone on before us, trusting in Jesus, did not go into some kind of a holding tank or a staging area. If you have buried one of God's children, understand that he was calling them home. It was their time. It was their time because it was his time. There's no such thing as an untimely death. You might read that in an obituary somewhere, or someone may say, oh, he met with such an untimely death. No, he didn't. It was in God's perfect time. Jesus had their place prepared, and he's also preparing a place for you and for me. Again, he has ascended into heaven for our interests. Jesus went bodily into heaven. Again, it's an indication, it's a precursor of what will happen to us one day. What he has done, we will one day do also. Paul told the believers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, that Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. First fruits means that there will be others to follow. He was the first, others will come behind him. Christ's resurrection is a prototype of resurrections to come. We read about the first fruits in Leviticus 23, verse 10. First fruits symbolize the consecration of the entire harvest to God. The harvest was being consecrated to the Lord by the first crops. It was an earnest or a pledge of the full harvest that is yet to be gathered. Paul said in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15 that every man would follow in his own order, meaning we all have a designated time. It's been appointed unto man wants to die. We have an appointment. God has it scheduled on his calendar. We don't know when it is. That's probably a good thing that we don't know when it is. I couldn't imagine what I would be like the night before. Especially if you don't know how it's going to happen. It's been appointed unto man wants to die. Hebrews 9.27 Paul then tells us in verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, that then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom. The kingdom, that's us, you and me, will be delivered to God. So whichever way we get there, whether it's through our individual dying or as a group in the rapture of the church, our bodies will ultimately be there. Now, Paul covers both of these scenarios. I know I'm moving you around the scriptures a little bit, but 1 Thessalonians 4, start with verse 13. I read this at the gravesite a lot when I'm burying a believer. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 <clears throat> says, and this is Paul speaking to the Thessalonians, he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So again, it covers both ways, either dying first or being alive when he calls his church in mass up to heaven. And then in verse 18, he says, we're to comfort one another with these words. So we see here again that the Lord is interceding on our behalf, and he has prepared a place for us. But there's more. We are indeed a blessed people. When we get saved, 99.9% .9 of us do not immediately go to heaven. Justification happens in an instant, but sanctification, as we've said many times, takes a lifetime. And because it does, the Lord has provided us with a helper, the Holy Spirit, a comforter, John calls him in John 14, 26. We're not left here alone. Jesus may have returned to heaven but believe it or not, we are better off because of it. Before the ubiquitous Holy Spirit was sent, you had to actually be with Jesus, wherever he happened to be at that point in time, to be in the presence of the Lord. But now, we can have the Lord with us wherever we are. John 14, 17, Jesus said, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, dwells with you and in you. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, that we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And who is the purchased possession that he's speaking of? It's us. We've been sealed. We've been taken care of by God himself. I don't think it gets any better than that. Tell me if you think it does. I, I, I can't imagine any other thing being better than that. I just want to make sure we fully understand, before I wrap this up, the meaning of the word earnest. Webster says it is a portion of something given or done in advance. It is like a pledge, like an assurance of more to come, an indication of what is to follow. If you put a down payment on something that you are purchasing, that's earnest money. Well, this is the earnest of the Spirit. This is the down payment of Christ for what is yet to come. And there's more. There's so much more. We don't have the capacity or the brain power to fully understand it. God would simply overwhelm us if he showed us what awaits us. The Holy Spirit moves through the Lord's people. He binds us to Christ. He moves the church of God here on earth. And again, all of what's going on, all of what you've seen for 2,000 years is only the beginning. Again, we couldn't contain the fullness of God's blessings if he poured them all out on us. But that day is coming. We have a great future ahead of us. But don't miss the blessed presence that we have right now. The Holy Spirit is here. He's here to guide us. He's here to protect us. He's here to give us comfort. We know we live in perilous times. The battle is raging all around us. 
Satan is hard at work. He knows his time is short. He's corrupting our culture. He's attacking our families and our churches. In fact, he is deceiving the church. We are under full attack. But just as Elisha's servant had his eyes opened in the city of Dothan, we need to understand that God has provided for us as well. You remember the story, Elisha's servant woke up one morning to see the Syrian army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. So, of course, he goes to Elisha and he says, what are we going to do? Do you see what's out there? What are we going to do? And Elisha answered, 2 Kings 6.16, 6, Fear not, he told his servant, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Greater is he who is in us than is he who is in the world. And then Elisha prayed, of course, that the Lord would open the eyes of his young servant, that he might see the provisions that God had made for them. And what did he see? But the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. The good guys. They outnumbered the bad guys. Jehovah Jireh. That means the Lord will provide. We need to have our spiritual eyes opened. We need to see that in spite of all the battles that are going on right now against the Lord's people today, be they Jew or Gentile, we still win the war. God has promised to save the nation of Israel. He'll also take care of the church. And as I said earlier, in spite of all of those brave patriots who gave their lives that we are honoring this weekend, in spite of that, there's nowhere in Scripture where it says God will save America. But he will save the church. All the Americans who are trusting in Christ as their Lord and Savior will be saved. We read in Romans 11, 25 through 27, that Israel's blindness is partial. It's partial because there are still Jewish people being saved today. Israel's blindness is also temporary. It's temporary until they acknowledge their Messiah, which they will do at the second coming. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes. What we're in is also called at times the age of grace. God extends his grace to those of us who are not Jewish. Thank God he's done that. When the church is complete and raptured into heaven, then God will turn again to the Jews, and he will save Israel at his return. So God has made provision for us until he comes back. So what are we to do? Occupy until he comes, Jesus said. Be watchmen on the wall. Stand in the gap. There's a battle going on. We're supposed to be out there being salt and light to an unsaved world. We need to stand, and having done all, to stand against the wiles of the devil, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. How do we do this? We need to put on the whole armor of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is our refuge and fortress. In him will we trust. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the belt of truth. And our feet have been shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is all scripture I'm reading to you. And above all, we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What shall we fear? Of whom shall we be afraid? We have the whole armor of God. And we have the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
God is in complete control. His plan is coming full circle until his enemies, as we read earlier in Psalm 110, are made his footstool. Satan has been cast down, and Christ has risen, and he has ascended. By virtue of Jesus' shed blood, his atoning sacrifice for us, he binds it all together from glory unto glory. His incarnation, his atoning death, and his resurrection, his ascension, his intercession on our behalf. What a plan! What a great plan. What a story we have to tell. So let's purpose to do that in our remaining days here on earth while we're waiting to be called home to join that great army in heaven that has gone on before us. Praise the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. And what a day of rejoicing it will be when we all get on the other side to be with you and our loved ones in heaven. Father, bless us in the meantime. Again, as we remember, there is a price to pay for going to battle. Again, this weekend, we remember the price of our nation's patriots. Lord, strengthen us. Keep us focused on you in all that we do, in Jesus' name. Again, we'll close by singing our song, which, again, us sailors are excited to call the Navy hymn, but it does speak to all the services. Eternal Father, strong to save. Please stand for our closing hymn, number 575. Eternal Father, strong to save.